Hello, I'm Ben Pink Dandelion, and I'm here in the Great Hall at Swarthmore Hall. And this is the second of four short films on the history of Quakerism. And in this film, I want to talk about the challenges of maintaining a movement and what happens to Quakerism through the 1660s, 1670s, and on into the 18th century. So in any new social movement, obviously there are challenges around leadership and this will happen amongst friends, but there are also difficulties in sustaining particularly radical claims. So Quakers are saying, well, we can be perfected and saved in this life, or what happens when one is drunk in the street uh, or found in the wrong bed, for example. And very early on, Quakers needed to modify their teaching in some way. So there's two ways they did this. One would be to deny that the wrongdoer ever was a Quaker, um, even if they'd attended Quaker meet meetings, we knew um, otherwise. But what they also do is start to introduce an idea of measure, that different people have different measures of the light. Yes, still the possibility of perfection, but not necessarily immediately. It might be about growth in the spirit. And the more light you had, the more you might be able to um, partake in. And so therefore someone who did fall short may still be living up to their measure uh, of the light. But quite quickly, we also get the uh, process of disownment coming in of a meeting saying that this person is not in spiritual unity with us. And that's still a practice that's available uh, today. There's other challenges. There's also about public image. One of the things Quakers also needed to do as they spiritualized uh, just about everything and, and relied very much on the authority of experience over the authority of scripture was to um, just make it clear that there was nothing in scripture that they actually disagreed with. People would say, well, you, you don't mention the gospels very much or the first coming of Christ. You're very strong on an inward sense of second coming of Christ. And they needed to make it clear that they were absolutely, of course, uh, you know, following gospel teaching as well. Some of this is about managing uh, or presenting Quakerism in a, in a particular way, being a little bit pragmatic in order to ensure the survival of the movement. And I think the major pragmatic moment in the first decade is when James Naylor, one of the other leaders of the early Quaker movement, is arrested in Bristol and then taken to be tried by Parliament for blasphemy, blasphemy um, for maybe perhaps claiming that he is uh, Christ, which by all accounts he wasn't doing. He was enacting a sign of Christ's entry into Jerusalem, a sign of the second coming of Christ. He narrowly um, escapes the death penalty. He's given a, a really horrible uh, punishment. Um, but at the time, Fox just says to Parliament, well, you need to do what you need to do with him. Uh, and this may look rather cold hearted, but this is also probably what is required at the time to um, help Quakerism survive. It's a fragile moment. You could imagine the equivalent of the tabloids of the day having having a kind of a, a field day with, you know, James Naylor, Quaker leader in Big Mac scandal. And Fox just needs to say, well, Parliament, you do what you need to do. In 1661, after the restoration of the monarchy, also Quakers will need to be pragmatic there. It's in the same year that the fifth monarchists, another second coming group, as it were, believing that the end of the world as we know it is nigh, took over the city of London for a few days before they were defeated and hanged. And the authorities, obviously anxious about spiritual uh, revolution, um, put 
4,200 Quakers into preventative detention. There were Quakers, almost 1% of the population. And who was the group who, who were most awkward? Uh, well, it was the Friends. And so many of those were, were put into jail. And at that point, Fox and 11 others uh, produced a document very similar to one that Margaret Fell had written six months before, just claiming to be a, um, a harmless and innocent people, that the monarchy didn't need to worry about the Quakers because the Quakers would not take up arms. So a pragmatic um, statement of what becomes later known as the peace testimony. There are a number of things Quakers did and didn't do as a result of their uh, spiritual experience. They obviously wouldn't pay tithes because that would be giving money to the opposition. They refused to swear an oath because it says in the book of Matthew, swear not at all. Um, they would refuse to take their hats off uh, except in prayer to God. And in general, really push against the kind of social hierarchies that so uh, have riddled and continue to riddle our society, not using titles, not using deferential terms, not bowing and scraping, not going through the worldly etiquette of good morning and how are you. But Fox said he would only speak if led to by God. Every utterance would be ministry. So, uh, he's not an uh, easy person uh, to deal with. This the story of him coming into said, but and someone realizing he had a different accent and saying, so where are you from? And he could have said, well, I'm from Fenny Drayton in Leicestershire. But instead, he just says, from the Lord. So always trying to be authentic and faithful in every utterance. There's the story of Thomas Elwood meeting his friends in, London, in Oxford. And uh, they see him and greet him in the traditional way, which you might imagine would be taking up your hat and bowing down. And, and he just stands there, almost as if they aren't there. And he doesn't say anything either. And later he will comment that he was glad as a new Quaker convert to be able to hold that spiritual integrity. So his friends though, maybe think he hasn't recognized him. He says, Tom, it's us. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, he just stands there. And then one of them realizes, what, Tom, a Quaker? Because who else? would not return a greeting or even utter a word. Just this difficult group uh, of Quakers. Quite early on as well, they start dressing more simply, adopting a plain language, thee and thou to everyone, rather than the polite and deferential you, and refusing to use the pagan-derived names for days of the week and months of the year. So first day for Sunday, just using numbers instead, second day, Monday, etc. So Quakers very quickly become audibly and visibly different, whilst needing to navigate the challenges of changing governments, uh, changing styles of, of governments as the monarchy is restored, and also needing to navigate huge persecution that will come from the 1660s. This is the time where the new parliament is full of the people displaced by the Republic. And it's a time to renew and restore the Church of England and to move against many of these upstart sects. In 1662 is even a Quaker act to outlaw the Friends' way. As I say, 4,200 Quakers were put into jail in 1661, after the fifth monarchist uprising. In the next 20 years, 11,000 Quakers will be jailed, with over 400 dying in prison, including many of the early leaders like Edward Burrow and Francis Howgill. Twice, George Fox is fairly sure he's going to die in prison, and he starts to dictate his journal at those moments. So there are a number of challenges facing friends. 
before finally in 1689, the Act of Toleration allows Quaker worship to be legal. And a few years later, the Act of Affirmation allows Quakers not to need to swear an oath in court. In the meantime, most of the energy of the movement has shifted from mission work, from proclaiming Quakerism as the true church, to just allowing the group to survive. Many will emigrate both for uh, freedom of religion and new economic opportunity, particularly after William Penn sets up Pennsylvania, a Quaker colony, a holy experiment in the new world. It is said that not one Quaker in Wales is left following migration to Pennsylvania. So that's one way in which Quakerism shifts. It becomes clearly a transatlantic movement. Um, and also that in Britain, Quakers are needing to guard against persecution, manage the effects of persecution. One of the other hallmarks, I suppose, of a social movement as it progresses is that it becomes more complex in terms of uh, rules and structures. And we find the setting up of various committees, meeting for sufferings to petition government on behalf of the sufferings of friends, second day morning me meeting, a Monday morning meeting, to look at the texts, texts that come out in the name of friends, to approve or otherwise uh, books and pamphlets that have been given to the committee for permission to publish. Quakerism starts to manage its image in a very structured way, manage its business in a structured way. We get the start of um, meticulous minute keeping. And we also get the advent of separate women's business meetings because it seems that whilst everyone is equal, including men, women, young people, that is not always realized in the political realities of the 17th century. Women are often not listened to. And so George Fox and Margaret Fell advocate for separate women's business meetings from 1675. So. so it's a time of change. It's a time probably what we might call of the second period, a more pragmatic period, uh, dating the beginning of that second period. It used to be 1666, after which Quakers stopped talking so much about the second coming, in spite of a fire and great fire in London and plague still the social order remains the same. Then it was 1660 after the restoration of the monarchy and then perhaps 1656 after the Naylor affair. And some are now saying, well, maybe it's 1653 as some of these theological change, uh, claims start to change. But what we can see moving into, into the restoration is a different perspective, a different kind of rhetoric uh, coming uh, through the Quaker tracks. And another hallmark, I suppose, of a social movement as it progresses is that instead of just being full of the energy and zeal of the founding charism, people start to reflect on it, write it down, and debate doctrine. And what we get in the 1670s is Robert Barclay's Apology for a True Christian Divinity. 15 propositions, all theologically argued and laid out, initially written in Latin for scholars, but then published in 1678 in English. And to a large extent, Barclay follows the teaching of Fox. The text gets through the second day morning meeting. They even appoint someone to check the Latin. And Fox had traveled with Barclay and spoken with Barclay and there's no record of any disagreement between them. Barclay maintains the doctrine of perfection and perfectibility, though on a kind of a slow burn 
uh, sense of timing. He also talks about the universal elect, the grace of God not leaving anyone behind. But he also needs to account in the face of criticism from non-Quakers of, of how and why some people will die unregenerate. So he does indeed talk about the God's day of visitation coming to all, very much in line with Fox's sense of unmediated experience being available to everybody and transforming everybody. But Barclay will add that whilst everyone has a day of visitation, should you miss it, should you outlive it, then there is no possibility of salvation for you. So in other words, everyone will have a moment, it doesn't mean a literal day, a period in which God's invitation is given to us. But if you turn your back on it or miss your moment, then you've had it. And that's why some people will die unregenerate. They do not accept God's invitation. Well, this, of course, could create great anxiety amongst a second and third generation of Quakers who have come into the movement not through their own personal experience of transformation or of insight, but because they've been born into the movement. And as one friend wrote, I knew that unless I experienced the power that had wrought such a change in my parents, I should be undone forever. And as we move into the 18th century, alongside this increasing complexity of, of Quakerism that sees elders and uh, a membership system and things like this introduced, increasing codification of the Quaker way, we also see plenty of examples of a spirituality of anxiety. People who are anxiously waiting for their own convincement, their day of visitation. And what if they missed it? So they need to be particularly observant, faithful, authentic, trying to wait faithfully. The last proposition of Barclay isn't about the second coming of Christ. It hasn't got that kind of end of the world perspective. Rather, it's called salutations and recreations, and it's about how to live in the Quaker meantime. So these are the Quakers of the 18th century in which the uniform becomes proscribed speech becomes prescribed, particular habits and ways become prescribed. Gravestones become outlawed as being about vanity. Um, there's a whole range of practices that become, as I say, codified. But also you get a group of people who are anxiously waiting, nervously, not doing certain things and trying very hard to do others. Paradoxically, all of those sort of outward forms of Quakerism, such as plain dress and plain speech, become the hallmarks of an inward spirituality. Whether someone should marry or not becomes a key matter of discernment and spiritual Tussle, there's a story, I think, of Catherine Phillips, who waits 23 years to be sure she's marrying the right person. And Joseph Conran sees Louisa Strongman across a crowded room, perhaps a business meeting, which became sort of marriage bureaus in a group where you needed to marry within the movement if you were to avoid disownment, only marry the faith and said, I knew at that moment that she was to be my wife. I felt a draft of love more than natural. And natural became a dirty word in the 18th century for friends. There was the supernatural, the heavenly plane to which they aspired, 
hoping once again, as the first friends had, to be co-agents with God, but feeling themselves on the human plane, hedged in, away from the world, another pejorative term, where they could only aspire to the heavenly plane and where they needed to protect themselves from the corrupt and corrupting world, the natural. So Joseph Conran says, I felt a draft of love more than natural. In other words, God given. And I knew at that moment that she was to be my wife. And I told her two years later and six years after that, we were married. The what of God's will and the when of it. These become the key hallmarks of the Quaker movement of the 18th century. We get an image of a very withdrawn people kind of living by a very kind of closed way. And that may be true in the meeting house and even in the family. But this is also a Quakerism that's out and about, commercially minded, doing very well in business, often making strategic marriages to uh, help Quaker enterprise but also uh, becoming a, a wealthy middle-class movement, distinct from its, its initial roots amongst the yeoman and artisan classes. Quaker banks get going. Quaker grocers and chocolate makers will appear. And a whole range of different economic activity will be the mainstay of Quaker occupations. It's those occupations, that busy, busyness, um, and the shift towards uh, urban communities that will allow Quakers to mix with many more Christians and to become more sympathetic to them. And in the next film, I'll look at what happens in the 19th century as Quakers become more relaxed about worldly endeavor and the rest of Christianity.